So I'll try to speak. Is that okay in the back? No complaints, so I assume that's fine. Um, yeah, so I will talk about practical things for white boxes, uh, design and attacks. So this will be two parts. So the first part will be, and the second part by Mark Witteman from Riskier. Um, again, as the title says, it will be more, we're looking at things from a practical point of view. Um, so my goal is to first talk a bit about where are white boxes used in practice, uh, how to design them, and then how to attack them. And the attack part is based on our paper, which will be presented next week at the CHESS. So the first question, of course, is we have seen this morning techniques um, from a theoretical point of view, what are the security models, uh, and we even saw some constructions. So in practice, the first question <coughs> is what do we want to white box? Um, so that boils down to two choices. Um, either if we want to white box some cryptographic algorithm, um, it will be either some standardized crypto algorithm, or, and that is now uh, in academia, what more and more people are looking at is new type of cryptographic algorithms. They are not standardized, um, but they have been particularly designed to help uh, create a white box implementation. And uh, in my talk, I will be mainly focusing on some of the part. So some standardized cryptography and for me, that just means A as we do So where is this used? So we saw that a little bit in practice uh, in the before lunch as well. So the original setting for which, where white boxes were introduced was in the, the DRM setting. So digital right management. Um, so remember what is a white box? It's a software implementation where the secret key is somehow embedded in this implementation and the user of this uh, implementation should be able to use the implementation, but not know the secret key which is embedded in there. So for DRM, think about streaming content. You get it in, you should be able to decrypt it and show it, but you should not know the decryption key because then you might give this key to your friend and then you can watch these movies as well. But white box is getting more and more attention um, and that's because of HCE. So what's HCE? We saw that before lunch as well. Host card emulation. Um, that's the topic because um, there are more and more use cases where people use, for instance, NFCs uh, to implement an, an emulation of a host card. And the idea there is to replace uh, the secure element with a software implementation. Um, and then, of course, you need to, instead of storing your secret key on a secure element, you need to protect it. And, uh, and this is exactly done with your white book. So why is this getting traction in practice? Um, because there's a huge demand for such practical and secure white box implementation. So in 2014, uh, Visa and MasterCard voiced that they would support uh, HCE. And according to uh, various research, um, we'll see that points of sale devices, both in the US and in Europe, uh, will go uh, up in the upcoming years. Uh, plus, if we look at the number of mobile devices which are shipped with NFC support, uh, which will be substantial as well. So then if you want to either go by public transport, you buy a train ticket for instance, or you just want to pay, um, chances are high that you will do this in a combination with NFC and HCE. And then of course, the protocols which are needed to implement this HCE um, are, rely on standardized crypto in practice, that means uh, AES. So there is a need to white box these symmetric key primitives. Um, and the question is, how can we do this? And is this actually secure? So recall, so uh, fortunately, this was uh, already uh, introduced several times. So I only made one short slide. So what is the white box model? You've seen that this whole morning. This is more a white box model from a hacker perspective. So you're given a software implementation, either the source code or in practice, of course, if you get a white box implementation, it will be just an executable, a binary. And then you assume that the adversary can be the user. So you have the device with the software implementation in your hands and you can do anything. And the anything means a static analysis or a dynamic analysis. So you can inspect the memory, you can inject faults, you can alter the implementation, run it in your debugger, halt it, dump memory, you can do whatever you want. And in this white box model, 
it should still be secure or some definition of secure and that's the whole discussion we've seen this morning. So what does it mean for a white box implementation to be secure? So this morning we talked about this as well. So we know from a theoretical point of view, obfuscating any program is impossible. Is this relevant to white boxes? Maybe not because white boxes are, of course, a very specific subset of all functions. Um, so it's actually unknown if we can create a secure white box implementation. It's an open question. But an interesting observation is, and that is what we will use later, is if a secure white box solution exists, so if it's secure in this model shown on the previous slides, then by definition, it should be secure to all the current and all the future uh, side channel and folder tabs. So it simply means it should not leak any information, no matter what type of meta information you're going to use from this implementation. The techniques you currently know or the techniques we don't even know yet because it simply should not leak. Um, but in practice, of course, the situation is quite different. So we only know how to build uh, symmetric crypto, uh, so white box symmetric crypto, but then we don't even know how to do that for standard, so I'm talking about standardized cryptographic algorithms. Uh, all academic designs are broken. And what, so what's the approach? <coughs> what do people do in practice? So you have your algorithm and you convert it to a series of lookup tables and you try to somehow embed your secret key in these lookup tables and they are trying to obfuscate these lookup tables such that if the adversary is looking at these lookup tables, hopefully you will not learn anything uh, about your key. So in a couple slides, um, how does this work? So what I will show here is a white box version of AES as it was introduced in the first paper by Chow. Um, so I, I will show a simplified version. So we omit the shift row operation. I mean, this is just renumbering of the indices. Uh, I will just want to show the high level ID because I think uh, it was already shown how it works. So the idea is if you have mixed columns, you split it in four. And then you, um, so all these uh, P's and M's are lookup tables. And then you just, um, once you compute it, you look the value up, you XOR them together, um, and hence you replace the basic operations in AES by lookup tables. So now we have a lookup table for the P's, for the M's, and for the XOR. Um, but of course, now we haven't done any obfuscation yet. We just replace the basic operations by lookup tables. So any um, adversary can simply extract all the information from this. So the idea is we're gonna, we're gonna obfuscate these lookup tables. So the first idea is we're gonna apply linear encodings. Um, so we have these AIs that will be a random 8-bit linear mapping, and we have this NB, which will be a random 32-bit linear mapping. So then, if you remember the picture from the last slide, the last slide, so we did this, and now we're just gonna put these uh, enc uh, encodings on the front. And then, of course, since this encoding is now put on top of this lookup table, it ne needs to be removed later. And that's exactly uh, what's happening. <coughs> and then we're gonna add and remove these encodings in every step of our lookup table. But of course, this lookup table will consist uh, already, so they, we will multiply this encoding with the actual value when we use the secret key. So this is about linear encodings, um, but then the idea is we're also going to add nonlinear encodings. So that's this uh, function f. So then if you have, uh, so this was the ID uh, in the original paper from 2002 by Chow. So then your AES implementation will look something like this. So you have your linear encodings and the green boxes are the nonlinear encodings, which you add and remove everywhere. Um, <coughs> and so they got an AES implementation of around 700 kilobytes. So you just replace every step with a lookup table. So that's the thing you need to remember. That's what's being done in practice. <coughs> and that's exactly the reason why it only works for symmetric crypto. If you look at asymmetric crypto, <coughs> if you look at RSA, or, or if you look at ECC, we don't know how to implement this <coughs> using small lookup tables. If you know how to do this using small lookup tables, you could use a similar technique uh, as is shown here. 
So white box crypto um, in practice. So white box, so white boxing, so cryptographic primitive is actually only a small part of the entire solution. Um, so for instance, we talked about code lifting uh, already this morning. So even if it's impossible, let's say, to extract a secret key from your white box implementation, <coughs> if you can still copy the entire implementation and run it on a different device, you've copied the functionality and you don't need to extract this uh, secret key. <coughs> so in practice, what do people do? They put on the white box strong code obfuscation just to make the life of a hacker more complicated. Then they try to glue uh, this binary to the environment in order to make this code lifting uh, more difficult. And uh, we already heard about trader tracing that you might want to put trader tracing in there that if it gets copied or misused, you can trace where this is happening. Um, and then of course, you want mechanisms for frequent updating. So that's essential for software security because then you don't you give the attacker no time or as little time as possible to actually attack this. Um, so this year at Eurocrypt, there's actually a really nice talk, not focusing on white box, but more on the code obfuscation and the other techniques applied um, by Chris and Polberg. So I really, um, it, I think his slides are now online. And so that, that really shows the other part of, of everything here. But for the remainder, uh, of the remainder of this presentation, I will be focusing just on the white box part and focusing on uh, can we extract the secret key from a white box implementation? Because if we can, then we don't even need to code lift it, right? We have the secret key, we can use it to, to copy the functionality of this implementation. So, uh, as it was mentioned before, um, in the previous effort, all the symmetric, uh, take AES for instance, all the white box AES approaches from academia are already broken. Um, but so, what knowledge do you need to actually break these uh, implementations? You need, so the attacks described in the, in the academic literature are very specific. You need to know the exact encoding to which cipher operations uh, are implemented, where in the implementation by which lookup tables. And once you know all this, then you can reverse engineer the implementation and then target these uh, specific lookup tables and then apply your algebra. So that's more or less the approach uh, people uh, used to do, and they showed how much effort it took to apply these steps uh, and break a white box implementation. So an approach I will show you um, in this implementation, <coughs> uh, in this presentation, it's quite different. So here, the only thing you need to know is which algorithm is implemented. Is it AES or is it DES? That's it. Once you know this, then it just works automatically without knowledge of any of the implementation choices you made uh, in the white box. And it simply ignores all the attempts at code obfuscation. You can apply as many code obfuscation as you want. We ignore it and we just extract the secret key. So how we're gonna uh, do this? So the idea is to trace binaries. Um, so remember, how does it work in practice? So if you look at academic designs, they're open. So you get the design specification and the source code. In practice, what of course you get is no specification, no source code, just a binary block. So just get a binary executable. So the idea is to create software traces, which are somehow, and I'll show it later, an analog of the power traces used in the hardware community for the gray box model. Um, and we're gonna create such software traces using dynamic binary instrumentation tools. So what are these type of tools? Um, so examples are, for instance, Intel PIN and Fogrind. So if you are a software developer or software engineer, um, chances are relatively high that you have worked with Fogrind before, for instance, to detect memory leaks or for debugging purposes. But actually, these tools are much, much, much more powerful. They can do much more. Um, and so what we did was we created plugins, both for Intel PIN and for Fogrind, uh, such that if you run your white box implementation. Uh, so if it's on a phone, you can use Fallgrind. If it's on your regular x86, you can use Intel PIN. And then while the implementation is running, we would record all the instructions and memory accesses made by the white box. So what then will this look like? So we created a, a visualization tool uh, based 
and on Petra, which is a Quark's lab tool, I'm gonna bring it this first in the row here, which was presented at the Hacker Conference uh, in 2014, and we really like this format. Um, so we reused their format. Um, so if you visualize such a software trace, it will look like this. So the time goes from top to bottom on the y-axis, and the memory range which has, is being accessed to is on the x-axis. If an instruction is being executed, it will show in black, memory reads in green, memory writes in red, and both in blue. So an example, um, if you have a big software trace, it will look something like this. And then the question, of course, is because we only need to know which um, algorithm is being implemented. So let's try and identify this. So here you see an example of a white box implementation. You see lots of things are happening, but when you zoom in on this <coughs> tiny bit here, you can actually see um, the crypto being executed. So we can see a pattern here of nine times four uh, lines. So any guess which primitive this might be? So this will be AES, but the tenth uh, row, uh, the tenth round, is quite a bit different than the other. So it's they hit it, they merged it in, in the book down there. Yeah. But then some implementations, so this is also a white box implementations, are a bit smarter. So they really try to hide their instructions. So it's just a serial execution. Um, so remember, this is black. So these are the instructions of the white box. Um, so from the code, we cannot really infer anything. But then the idea is, let's not look at the code, but let's look at the memory ad address that's being accessed. So then it immediately reveals a nice lookup pattern uh, here. So it's one plus 15, so the one is on the top left, and then 15, so this will be the <coughs> PES. But then there are even smarter white box implementations, which also try to hide uh, the, the memory accesses. So the code, just sequential and the memory access is also sequential. So how can we now figure out which <coughs> algorithm is white box here? So the idea is if you look at this small memory range here, it's really hard to protect that. That's the stack. If you zoom in on the stack, you can immediately, uh, so this is exactly the zoom of the, the tiny portion on the previous slide. If you zoom in, you will again see reads and writes uh, on your stack done by your implementation, and this immediately reveals that we're dealing with DES here as well. All right, so what? So we have now, we have software tracing, and we can um, identify which algorithm is white box. Okay, that's all very nice, but how are we gonna use this to extract the secret key from the implementation? So the idea is to use techniques um, which are very well known in the, in the gray box community. So, for instance, take DPA, so the differential power analysis. So if you're not familiar, and I think some of the more practical guys here who also attend chess are very familiar, maybe some of the theoretical guys who are here are not that familiar with it, so a one slide overview. So the idea is that you're gonna, uh, in a hardware implementation, for instance, um, measure some meta information. It might be radiation, it might be power, and then you're gonna make uh, guesses at a point where the key is used. So for instance, if we're talking about <coughs> AES after subbytes, and then you're gonna try to correlate these guesses with the power measurements done, and if there's a high correlation, you might be able to extract one by one the key bytes uh, of the secret key of AES in this case. So this is a very uh, well-known technique uh, in, in the, for hardware implementations. So first what we could do is we have our white box implementation, um, we take it, we, we code test it, put it on a smart card, and we're gonna measure the power consumption. You could definitely do this, but this would be rather stupid. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're gonna do, of course, is use, use our uh, software tracing environment. We're gonna create software traces, so which memory locations are being accessed, and then we get a nice list uh, of me memory locations being accessed, um, where the memory, of course, is the stack as well. And if we then, for instance, only take the, the least significant or the most significant, doesn't matter, byte of the addresses being accessed, and then we plot it, we get a nice uh, software trace. So what do we have here? The values, because it's a byte, we have 256 uh, possible values. 
but then what? Um, these values are very dominated, of course, the, 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 the real value by their most significant bit. So what we, of course, could do is do the same thing as the hardware guys do. So we can think of it as working in the Hemming weight model. So we take the Hemming weight of these traces, then we get eight possible discrete values. And if you would now stop, it would, the attack would already work. So this would allow you to break white box implementations. Um, but we can actually do much, much better. Because once you stop and you realize why the guys in the hardware model take the Hemming weight, it makes lots of sense there. Um, however, we are in a completely different setting. Um, and once you realize that actually every bit is equally important, we will just serialize um, this trace, and then we just get a very boring looking trace with the eight uh, sequential zero and ones in every byte, and then you get a trace which can only have two possible values, a zero or a one. So this looks much less interesting than the fancy nice hardware traces, um, but this <coughs> will be much more powerful. So why is that? Because think about it, what do these bits actually mean? Um, they are the measurements taken from your software implementation without any error. So this would be the same as in hardware, like probing your bus line individually and measure and when there's no measurement error. So this is like the perfect situation. So we ran this, um, so we looked around for white box implementations to, to, to <coughs> test if we could actually extract the key using um, so the similar techniques as in the gray box model in the white box model. And um, we found uh, these challenges online. So um, the first challenge put online is by, by Brecht. Um, and the other challenges, so the second and the third, are from hacker conferences who put a public white box challenge online. And the last one is from a uh, master thesis uh, of somebody who implemented the most recent uh, approach, the, the Karomi approach to implement white box AES. So unfortunately, we couldn't find any challenges from industry or companies uh, who were confident enough and said, look, we have a white box solution. Here we put an uh, example and please try and do some crypt analysis. Um, so we looked at these, these public ones and um, it was really, really easy to extract private keys from them. So for these two, it was really easy because they, like I said, you have these linear and non-linear encodings from all your lookup tables. There they didn't even apply them. It makes sense, it was for a hacker conference and their challenge was that uh, participants should be able to break it in one day with these algebraic attacks because of course this attack wasn't around yet. Um, so what Brecht did and in the, the, the Karomi approach, it was uh, these encodings were present, but still um, we were able to extract by just pro pro uh, having your guess and correlate them with the software traces, we were able to extract the <coughs> So why does this work? And so this has been studied already in, in a follow-up paper, which is this year at, uh, at FSE. Um, so the idea why this works is because the encodings which are being applied to these lookup tables are not able to uh, sufficiently hide these, these, uh, the, the correlations. So of course, we know this from uh, the gray box model. Uh, we know this from the 90s, uh, these types of attacks. And since the 90s, this has spun up a huge amount of research, and that's why we have the chess conference. Um, and they studied a lot of countermeasures. Um, but most of the countermeasures against these types of attacks rely on random data. So you will apply a randomly generated mask, your masking values. Um, but of course, in the white box attack model, we cannot rely on random data. Where would you get your random data? If I had my white box implementation and I would try to sample a random number generator, and I'm the hacker, I will just set the entropy of my random number generator on my phone to zero, and it would sample zero. Um, so maybe we can try to use some static random data within the white box itself. What else can we do? Uh, the only entropy source coming into the white box is of course the input. So we might be able to use the input message as some sort of uh, random entropy. I don't know, these were just random ideas we were thinking about how to protect against these types of attacks. Um, then DCA does not always work when you use these large encodings. They might be uh, good enough to hide uh, the actual correlations, but 
the side effect is then your lookup tables get larger and larger. Um, and then the other side effect is that they might be really easy to break with the currently known algebraic index. So then DCA might not work, but the algebraic index works. So maybe as a follow-up work, it might be interesting to study IDs from threshold implementations. So in hardware, this is quite a sophisticated and good way of, uh, so it's a masking scheme based, based on multi-party computation. And this might actually work in, in software setting as well. So that might be interesting thing to study. But if we look at practice, um, what can we do from a practical point of view? Uh, we can try to invent some really good anti-debug techniques because when we do, our, we do our software tracing, we run our white box uh, inside our DBI framework, of course. And if this implementation can somehow detect that it's running inside a DBI, it might just stop working. Um, but there are now a whole series of papers at hacker conferences where people are getting better and better at just disabling these anti-debug techniques. Um, so this will again be a cat and mouse game between a good anti-debug uh, countermeasure and then hackers getting around this countermeasure. So this will be a practical remedy, not a theoretical remedy. And then maybe more code obfuscation, because like we said, code obfuscation, we just measure memory access is being done and we don't care about code obfuscation. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, but I suppose we can DDD obfuscate the lookup table. So these would have still apply? Yes. So yeah, you just need to ensure that there's no correlation between the memory accesses made and the guesses I can do. So and, and one of these things is by using larger encodings to really obfuscate um, this, this correlation. But that's a, a whole bunch of other side effects. So it's kind of an attack on the lookup table rather than the main source of the secret. Yes, it's yes. It's on the lookup table and how the usage of the secret key is protected there. So in order for other people to look at this as well, we put uh, all our attacks, uh, our scripts to all the individual um, uh, white box implementations uh, and our, our uh, DBA tool uh, online in GitHub. So if people want to help or if they know of more white box challenges, please let us know. We'll add them to the website. Um, so to our surprise, for instance, uh, a CPA tool, which is a tool which can compute these correlations, we couldn't find any open source implementation of this, so we just created one ourselves. So this might be of independent interest. Uh, of other people and academics as well. So, what's the takeaway message here? So, it is simply a fact software only solutions, so white box solutions are getting more popular, so they're definitely still used in, in the DRM setting, but it's now getting traction because of uh, HCE. Um, but the level of security of many, all, I don't know, so we didn't look at the in industrial uh, white box schemes. Uh, is questionable, um, and it's still an open problem how we can actually create asymmetric white box crypto. So companies are selling this, but we have no clue how to do it. So that's already an interesting fact. Um, because industry keeps all their designs secret, because they published them before, but they all got broken in HTTP. Um, so how is this different than the attacks we know? So this is an automated attack, no expertise is needed. You only need to know what is implemented. Is it AES or DES, and then which white box technique we don't care. You just run the software tracer, you run a, uh, your DBA on that, and you're done. That's your contribution to that. But what if DCA fails? So like I said, maybe we get countermeasures, maybe they do use large encoding, so it might not work in all scenarios. Can we do better? So of course, from the, from the, from the chess community, we know about lots and lots of other uh, attacks. So there are uh, there's a fault attacks, higher order attacks, so um, Riskier already showed um, that the differential fault attacks will work as well on software <laughs> implementations. And so we looked at that as well. And uh, so on our GitHub, we have an implementation uh, open source to compute these DFAs. So these are the, the references. And I'd love to take any questions. Thank you. So 
Like because I said, it will not always work. So if you, for instance, take these large encodings, mm -hmm. um, then this attack won't, will, will not work anymore. Because no. it will make applying this. Maybe it could, it could scale to. But yeah, your lookup tables will get a lot much larger. Yeah. Or not. So it depends how large you make, but I think, so for instance, from every lookup table, which is now size two to the four, will become two to the eight. Okay. And, and you think the attack couldn't be um, like improved? To, uh, no, I definitely think that that can be improved. Um, if we look here, so there are all these other techniques, so there are fault injections, higher order, yeah. so it depends on the type of countermeasures, mm -hmm. but this is just the first step. So that is, I think this will open up lots of new research uh, to look into this topic, and people will come up with countermeasures, and then they will they'll be broken again. Have you seen any analysis of value of risk? For? Well, the use cases for scaling. Yes. Yeah. So, so, what, so, 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 to, to me personally, I really think it's given, I mean, this research, it's very premature to already apply. Uh, white box implementation on a large scale for payment, but I mean, that's already being done. Mm -hmm. If we see from, from the gray box uh, world, so the hardware implementations, we have uh, certification schemes. Before you can deploy an implementation, it gets certified, a third party will look at it <coughs> and say, we think it's this or this secure, and you get a grid. For software implementations, there's nothing. People can just say, I'm secure, I'm gonna sell my product. And I think in order for this area to grow up, there needs to be some sort of certification. Any other question? Okay, so thank you very much again. <laughs>